Hello, and welcome to lecture number six of section three of the Marlboro Medieval Studies course. This is the very last lecture. Now, in this lecture, I have two main goals. I'm going to review a little bit of where we've been, and I'm going to talk about what the end of the medieval period actually means, since this is both the end of the lecture series, the end of the course, and ostensibly the end of an era. What, what does that actually mean? So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then at the end, I'm going to talk some about travelers, and the main topic is globalization. So first of all, we've now gone through the time period three different times. We started with politics, then and who holds power. We talked some about peasants, peasant relationships. Then we went through religion, talked about mostly the development of the Catholic Church, a handful of things beyond that, but obviously talking about the medieval period, the Catholic Church is the certainly the largest single player. And then in the last few lectures, we've gone over the economy, the daily life, some development in material culture over the same time period. Now, these three sets started in somewhat different places. We, there, we talked a bit about the end of Rome, both in power and then in religion. We go even further back. If we're talking largely about Christianity and the Catholic Church, it makes some sense to start back at the beginning of Christianity, the year zero. Now we breeze through the first three or four hundred years. There's a lot more that could be done about that. The beginning of the time period varied a little bit from each one. For the economic set, beyond a handful of little comments about what the economy of Rome generally looked like, we started roughly where we did with politics, around the year 300. And now, having gone through the late Roman economy, the contraction of the European economy after that, what things looked like under the Carolingian Empire, agriculture and feudalism in the 10th and 11th century, something about the growth of the economy in the 11th and 12th, the crisis of the 14th, or what is what is referred to as the crisis. That means a number of different things, and it's not purely economic. Um, we now have come to the 15th century and the end of the period in, in all sorts of different senses. And medieval history courses, if, if you look at a number of different schools, where they actually end varies. You occasionally see them ending in 1300, 1350. Some end with the crisis, the Black Death, and, and consider that lots of things shift after that. And of course they do. The Black Death is a major event. And some of them go up to about 1500. I think of this as going to 1500. Obviously a lot of what we're going to talk about today is in the 15th century. And we're going to talk about Columbus, which is right at the end of the 15th century. And after that, you begin to get what is usually referred to as the early modern period, especially in, in English-speaking universities. That tends to be the phrase that we prefer that for what comes after that. So what distinguishes then the early modern period from the medieval period? Why, why do we draw that distinction? Now, for me, part of this is that there are a whole series of watershed events or moments sometime between 1450 and we'll say 1550, although that's late. Really, really 1517 would be the last of the major events that I want to point out. Now in 1450, you already have plenty of glimmers of the sorts of things that especially in art and literature, we think of as the Renaissance. Um, Boccaccio has already been writing at the, the middle and end of the 14th century especially in Florence, the, the great cathedral with the dome designed by Brunelleschi, which is considered a, a monument of Renaissance architecture. That's really begun and completed in the early part of the 15th century. The dome is largely completed by 1436. There are any number of other major artists in the 15th century that we think of as Renaissance, no longer medieval, whose sculptures are beginning to look more like classical Greek sculptures, um, who are beginning to value more lifelike or more realist renditions of figures, especially in sculpture. So you have famous sculptures, sculptors like Donatello. By the end of the 15th century, you, you have some of the paradigmatic artists of what we think, what we refer to as the Renaissance. People like Michelangelo, obviously, who lives from 1475 to 1564. He, he's right in this time period that I think of as the pivot from 
late medieval to early modern. And there are other similar changes in, in music um, that I won't go into here, but suffice to say, uh, cultural shift is one of the things going on, although that is a slower, more measured response. Because, of course, even as Boccaccio is writing, you have people like Chaucer, who is considered a paradigmatic medieval writer, still writing in England at the same time. At any rate, 1450 to 1550, some of the landmarks that I think of historically is really mattering. In 1452, Gutenberg begins printing his Bible, 1452 to 1454. Now, Johannes Gutenberg himself had probably invented the movable type printing press as early as 1450, but the Bible isn't all the way prepared until 1454. Now, it's not just that he prints his Bible, obviously. Part of this is the invention of movable type at all. If you were to take a course on early modern Europe, one of the things that gets talked about a lot in the 16th and 17th century is the arrival of pamphlets and pamphleteering, that anybody can now write short tracts or treatises on theology, on politics, on economics, on all sorts of different thoughts and debates going on in society, and that these can be spread around to a relatively wide number of people. You are no longer restricted by handwritten text. Now, handwritten text doesn't disappear, and indeed early modern printing often tries to emulate some of the handwritten texts of previous centuries. But the invention of the printing press gets underway something that really will make the early modern period look very different from the medieval period. Now, the second major landmark is the fall of Constantinople. It's the fall of a single city. There are cities warring all the time, different nations and groups sacking different places. But the fall of Constantinople represents not just the end of that city and its conquest by Ottoman Turks, but the end of the Byzantine Empire. And for much of the medieval period, and as I said back in lecture number two of, of Politics and Power, I didn't talk nearly enough about Byzantium over the course of these lectures, but Byzantium was a stable and powerful force for the entirety of this period. And they thought of themselves and represented themselves as the inheritors of the Roman tradition, that, that Rome remained in the Mediterranean we talked about the, the barbarian tribes and its conversion to Christianity, its dissolution into client states, and the politics in the 5th and 6th century. But Byzantium, and with its capital in Constantinople, considered themselves Roman emperors and, and never really disappeared until 1453. So this is a major turning point, both in terms of large Christian powers, but also in the memory of, of the importance of Rome and of Roman polity. Any claim to an actual Roman emperor now is only through the, the so-called Holy Roman Emperor, which we've talked about plenty in the West, and what that term even means and how direct a claim that is to emperorship. But what it does is it removes the, the Byzantine Empire from the East and it sets up the Ottoman as one of the main power players, especially in the Mediterranean. So from 1453, really to World War I, the entirety of the early modern period, and I, I won't go into when the early modern period ends, that can be disputed also, but from 1453 to World War I, the Ottoman Empire is one of the main players in European power politics, and certainly in the 15th and 16th century, a lot of Mediterranean dynamic is set up by the, um, the expanding empire of Spain on one side and the Ottoman Empire on the other, and no longer mediated by the Orthodox Byzantine Empire as it was for the previous thousand years, basically. Now, moving to Spain, across to the other growing Mediterranean power, one of the other landmarks, and this is probably obvious, especially if I'm talking to an American audience, Columbus sails in 1492. Now, Columbus is not the first. This is a watershed only insofar as Columbus gets there and comes back. Uh, back in 1291, we know that the Vivaldi, a pair of Italian brothers called the Vivaldi brothers, commissioned some ships. They sailed out the Strait of Gibraltar. They said that they were heading due west. They were never heard from again. Now, for all we know, they actually made it here. Nobody knows where their ships are. Nobody knows where they landed, if they got caught in a storm. No idea. And obviously, people will, will point to the fact that the Vikings probably landed in northern Canada. At any rate, the fact that Columbus finances a set of ships, gets his three ships across the Atlantic, and comes back 
and pretty quickly realizes, okay, where we got to is not China like we thought we were going to get to, but actually this whole new place. The new European contact with the Americas sets in motion all sorts of things that were were not on anybody's radar in the medieval period. Um, it sets into motion Spanish expansion into a huge empire. The fact that many, many people in Central and South America are both Catholic and Spanish speaking starts from um, Columbus's voyage. Um, it makes Spain one of the wealthiest countries in Europe for about a century, although they, I guess some would say they squander that wealth. That is, there, there's a whole story to be told about the Spanish Empire. And we talked only about the beginning of that with the unification of Spain under Ferdinand and Isabella, which is, of course, the, the image that we're looking at here. Now, I have three more major elements. One of them also will stay in Spain for just a minute, but it really applies to all of Europe. If you take a second and look at this map of Europe in 1400, this is the map that is up on the screen, you can see something of the influence of, of medieval polity. That, as we've talked about, medieval states were not large centralized powers, but t tended to be devolved into duchies or smaller units that were not always uniform. And even this map is too big and too generalized. There were lots of smaller subdivisions that mattered a lot in the late medieval period. And those subdivisions don't cease to matter in the early modern period. But by 1500, and here we'll go to the next map in 1500, you can already begin to see certain territories taking shape, right? Going back to 1400, one of the main things that changes, Byzantium disappears. You can already see the Ottoman Empire has taken a lot of, of the Anatolian Peninsula, but of course in 1500 they've taken all of it and they've really consolidated it into an imperial area. The other thing that changes is that France and Spain become much more unified. Spain, we talked about some with the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella. It doesn't fully unify them. It doesn't mean that the Kingdom of Navarre or Aragon cease to matter those divisions continue to matter, and in fact, continue to matter to today. In particular, Catalan senses of separate and Catalan separatists today who no longer who do not want to be part of Spain. Now, much of this also goes back to the Civil War. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves. But the unification in the 15th century creates an idea of Spain as a single country. Now, they're unified by the marriage of, of Castile and Aragon, as we talked about, but it really comes to be dominated by the Castilian crown. And that will be true for a long time, even though the polities of, of Aragon and Catalonia and some of the other local governments and local regions continue to matter a great deal. That said, this unification that is also happening in France and England, in part in response to the Hundred Years' War, that where the kings of France and England come to dominate their internal territories much more over the course of the conflict over the English king and the French king's right to certain portions of land. The end of the Hundred Years' War, it, it really bleeds on into about the middle of the 15th century, but it does help to determine by the end of it, the English really only have control over the city of Calais, and it determines the English borders as being entirely on the other side of the channel, and the French borders as going to the Atlantic Ocean as they do today. Now, other parts of Europe, as you can see even in the map in 1500, Germany and Italy are in no way unified. That has to wait until the 19th century. So, as I said, it's not as if states suddenly erupt in the 15th century and then everybody has a big centralized state and Louis XIV is coming. But the idea of centralized power is, is growing in this period and will continue to grow throughout the early modern period. Now, the next major milestone at the end of the medieval period is also probably an obvious one a la Columbus, and that would be Martin Luther. We talked at the end of the religious section about some of the other reformers, Wick, uh, John Wycliffe, John Hus, and citing Martin Luther is perhaps not fair to somebody like John Hus, who has a real criticism of the Catholic Church that does last and, and really does mean something. However, it's Martin Luther's 95 Theses in 1517 that become a real lasting split in the Catholic hierarchy. And as many people probably know, this leads not just to Lutheranism, but eventually to the Anglican split, Calvinism, the subdivision of Protestant churches into a number of different ones, um, the Catholic both backlash, but also counter-reformation where the, they try to 
restructure the Catholic Church and even take into consideration some of the criticisms of the Protestant churches. The, the Catholic-Protestant divide becomes permanent and important and a major feature of Christianity moving forward. And it's not entirely unfair to pin that on the date, the date 1517. Now, the last aspect is the invention of racial slavery. And, and obviously, the slave trade is a major feature of early modern Europe. Slaves exist in the, medieval, in the medieval period, and I've mentioned them in a couple of previous lectures, but it is not racialized in the same way. Christians would routinely take Muslim captives, Muslims would do, routinely take Christian captives, and those captives could be sold as slaves, and they had no legal right to their own labor. The definition of a slave, they could be bought and sold um, as if they were property. However, there was always ways out. It was understood that the person who you had as a slave was not necessarily somebody you wanted to keep in permanent slavery. There were routinely offers that if you converted, you could get out of your slavery condition, um, although Christians and Muslims both had Christian and Muslim slaves also, so it wasn't a guaranteed way out. You could also be ransomed if you were from a wealthy family. Um, your Christian or Muslim captors might write to your family and say, hey, you can buy this person's freedom, you can get them back out in exchange for a certain amount of money. All of these are features that we don't associate with early modern slavery and the slave trade. And this really starts, Portuguese traders had been moving down the coast of Africa pretty continuously over the course of the 15th century. Um, they make contact with Mali, and on the way back, basically when they go down, they have to hug the coast, but on the way back, you have to swing out a little bit in the Atlantic. And so they discover some of the sets of islands that still belong to Portugal today, the Madeiras, the Azores, um, eventually Chao Tomé, a little further south. Um, and the Madeiras and the Azores are both unpopulated when they get there. The Spanish get to the, the Canaries, and the Canary Islands are known about, but they actually have groups of people who we think are descendants of Berbers from Morocco already living there. They're eventually uh, conquered and, and all but wiped out by the Spanish who take over the, the Canary Islands in 1496. But in the second half of the 15th century, Port first Portugal, then Spain, begin importing mostly black African slaves to these islands to work on plantations, both growing grain, barley, and wheat, but also growing sugar. And sugar, obviously, is going to become the commodity of the slave trade. The first sugar mill on the Madeira Islands is opened in 1452, right? The same year that, that Gutenberg begins working on his Bible, the year before Constantinople falls, so right in line with all of these other events. And by around 1500, there are as many as 2,000 mostly black African slaves. Some of them are bought from the kingdom of Mali in the same way that, that the Mediterranean system of captives produced slaves. Internal war in Central Africa also produced slaves. But they're getting more and more black Africans. Um, and there are no natives left in the Canary Islands, so the Spanish begin to do the same. And this proves to be very successful. They're not asking for ransom for them. They think of them as racially or ethnically different than they are. They begin to articulate why that is a better system of slavery, and it's permanent slavery. There is very little way out um, for the people that they have bought and are using. And obviously, by the time you get to the Caribbean or the American South, not only is there almost no way out for the slaves themselves. There's no way out for their children or their children's children. It becomes a permanent racialized system of slavery instrumental to the economy in a way that it was not in the beginning of the 15th century. So obviously several of these watersheds are the end of long processes. Ottoman conquest of Byzantium had been going on for a hundred years before they take Constantinople. The Reformation had several notable predecessors, John Hus and John Wycliffe, who we've talked about before. And some of them are the beginning of what will be also several hundred year long processes. The discovery and eventual conquest of the Americas, which takes a couple of hundred years and has its own trajectory in the early modern period. The development of slavery over the same time period. These are things that start in the 15th century that will produce radical changes, but perhaps some of them a hundred years down the road. So this is a collection of the things that I see as the end of the medieval beginning of the early modern period. Things that, that radically change the economy, the culture, how power is, is wielded, 
what people think of their sense of the world, the role of Christianity, all of the features that we've talked about through this course. So with those in mind, we're now going to move to the second half of the lecture, which is going to focus more specifically on economy and specifically on globalization, which is one of the things that I think has been a long process. Globalization has been going on for, for several hundred years by the time we get to the 15th century, but it gets a real jump. And we're going to talk about some of the economic aspects of that and a couple of famous travelers starting in the 14th century, including the 15th century. And that will be our economic topic for the end of the economic period. Now, the assignments that go with the lecture today include some of Columbus's letters, some of Columbus's journal excerpts, and a letter. And if you read those, they, they help to give you an impression of what it is that Columbus is really concerned with. When he sets sail, and I, you know, I realize that he is the end of a whole series of travelers, he has in mind all of these things that have come before him. Um, he takes with him Marco Polo's description of his journey to China. Columbus not only expects that he will find China, but he also has all of these interests in what he will find as regards Christianity, as regards spices and wealth and trade. And part of this comes out of the fact that for the last 200 years before he says sail, and, and even further back than that, but 12th, 13th, 14th century, Europeans had been traveling around the globe, but they also had a whole series of narratives and concepts to draw on about what there was out there to find. They had a general sense of what they could go out and find in foreign places, even though they didn't know exactly what they were going to find. And one of the things that drives this idea is that they have an idea of extreme wealth in foreign places. There are a lot of narratives going around that there are incredible amounts of gold or jewels or spices or very valuable things, particularly things that can be found in the East. One of the legends is that spices are pieces of things from the Garden of Eden that have fallen into the rivers of the Garden of Eden and flow out of it. So these are heavenly foods. Um, and they thought that the, that Eden was in the East, and so these four rivers came out that must have distributed more of these things further East than they were. Now, of course, they're right about the fact that spices come from the East, but obviously that's not exactly how we get them. Um, they tend to grow on things. So one of the things that they assume when they go out is that they will find incredible amounts of wealth and value, and they really think that that is out there for the taking. One of the narratives that goes along with that is that there there was an assumption it breaks down over this time period especially as people actually go there and discover it that where the where the wealth lies people don't consider it to be wealth because there's so much of it that it is much less valuable so this is one of the things that sort of drives them to go discover this if you want there's actually a, a podcast in my podcast series the history cafe that is on the spice trade and i talk a little bit more about these attitudes of great wealth. But suffice to say, one of the things that they thought they would find was a legendary Christian kingdom called the kingdom of Prester John, um, Priest John, who's supposed to be both king and priest and presides over a huge Christian kingdom with wealth and armies and, and gold and gems and spices, etc. And it was said to be further by leagues than China. They thought, well, you know, we know people have been to China and it doesn't seem to be China because as far as we can tell, they're not Christian and, you know, they weren't. Um, so they thought, well, we just keep having to go farther. Sometimes they think it might be Ethiopia. Um, at any rate, it's, it's this collection of stories that, that drives them to continue looking for it. And Columbus thinks that he can find it by going, you know, going in the other direction. Um, and before I continue, I should note briefly, we're talking about globalization, right? But globalization is pretty old and has been going on for a long time. Um, people have probably heard of the so-called Silk Road, not just silk traveled along it, right? It's a sort of series of connections between Central Asian trading cities that did bring goods from China to the Roman Empire. Alexander the Great knew that there were cities and things out there to be conquered that led him basically to the, to the edge of India by the end of his series of conquests. So the Greeks already, centuries before Columbus sails, uh, 2,000 years almost, are, are well aware that there is a lot of material space out there where, where people can go. Um, silk continues to traverse from China to Europe really without ever stopping from, from Greek times all the way through to Columbus's time. It fluctuates how commonly and eventually they figure out how to 
grow silk in Europe, and there's a, a legend that monks brought it across the Silk Road in their staves, the, the eggs, which of course was punishable by death for taking them out of China. Anyway, there are lots of stories. That, that is another one about how valuable these things are, that, that people tell themselves that they have a lot of it, but, but if only we could get it back here, then, then we know the real value of it. So Columbus is one of a long set of steps towards globalization. And, and part of what makes it significant, of course, is that it produces lasting contact between Europe, Asia, the Mediterranean, Africa, and the Americas, um, which was not a feature of Roman globalized trade in any sense. First, we're going to take a step back and look at a couple of other travelers who made really long distance trips, the sort of European sense of exploration and expansion before 1492. Um, now, one of these, and here's a couple of images from the traveler John de Mandeville's travels, which I'll get to in a second. But even before John de Mandeville, a man named William of Rubruck is sent by the King of France to make contact with the Mongols in 1253, 1255. Now, Initially, there are some people in Europe who think that the Mongols are going to be the armies of Prester John that are supposed to come and, and help them crush Islam permanently. Now, the Mongols do a good job of taking over big chunks of Islam, certainly, but it turns out that they are, of course, not Christian, not Prester John, um, and the Europeans become increasingly nervous about them, although it turns out they don't actually make it as far as Europe, but that has very little to do with Europeans or Christianity. Now, as William of Rubruck travels across the Central Asian steppe to find the Mongols, he has really pretty accurate descriptions of China, and there are many ways in which he is a more astute observer than Marco Polo, who travels later. One example of that is that in his writings, he notes fairly accurately how Chinese writing works. He seems to understand that it's pictographic, that different characters, while they can have similar sounds, each has its own word meaning and how they, they cluster together. So he, he's quite astute to what is going on around him. And while he is an emissary for Christianity and a Christian king, he is still at least interested in what is going on. Now, lots of people actually went to China. Um, even before Marco Polo, we know for certain that at least 100 people between 1240 and 1360 visited China, came back, had stories. So there's an increasing amount of actual knowledge mixing in with all of the legendary and story knowledge going around Europe. The second one I want to look at is, is John de Mandeville. And John de Mandeville sets out in 1322, about 60, 70 years later than William of Rubruck. And these are images from his travels. Shows him setting out in his boat here on Michael Mass of 1322. And then a, an image of Constantinople where you can see the, the Hagia Sophia portrayed. Now, he provides pretty reliable, as, as far as we can tell, accurate descriptions of Cyprus, places in Syria. Um, he visits Baghdad, but after Baghdad, his descriptions get a little bit fuzzier. It seems like he was in India. He mentions coastal cities. Um, one of the things that he does, there's an interesting set of stories about pepper being black and spicy because it is guarded by poisonous snakes that you have to get away from the pepper and the poison soaks in or the fumes soak into it and turn the pepper black and that's part of why it's so that's what pepper is um, but he mentions seeing pepper harvesting and he describes it in a fairly realistic way and of course this changes what people think about pepper because oh it, it turns out it just grows on a bush and you pick it and grind it it it, it takes away some of the glamour and some people identify his pepper harvesting in the coast as as him having gotten all the way to indonesia it's not clear where he is because in part he doesn't have names for these places. He knows when he's in Baghdad. He knows what Baghdad is because they've had enough contact with Islam that that is an identifiable place to him. But as he travels further east, while the descriptions may be accurate and we can recognize Pepper, we don't exactly know what his itinerary was. And, and part of this, if, if, if you remember, when we looked at maps briefly, the uh, the TO maps versus the Portolan charts, the Portolan charts really only existed for the Mediterranean and some parts of the North Sea coast, a little bit of the African coast. So they could make accurate maps of places that they had been, but the rest of the world really had this, this uh, narrative or mythic overlay that they were seeing all of these things through. Now, it's with this backdrop that a number of people have already been to China. There's an interest in these travel narratives. People really want to know where they've been and what they've seen that, that Marco Polo himself sets out. Marco Polo is before John of Mandeville. 
um, but not by that many years. And, I, and I've saved Marco Polo for last in part because his book becomes one of the most popular. And in part it is popular not just because he goes to China and describes a bunch of things, but because it is both, it is a really excellent melding of legendary things and real things. He, he's not as astute an observer as William of Rubruck, but he's more reliable generally than John Mandeville and full of a lot of similar concepts. He mentions things like, like dog-headed people and people who have one big foot and so-called monstrous races. Um, and he notes that he hasn't seen them where he expected. It's funny, sometimes he mentions legendary history and says, you know what, I'm still looking for the dog-headed people. I, I haven't seen them yet. I'm not sure where they are. And while there is some doubt as to whether or not he went to China, there, there, there's a book called Did Marco Polo Go to China? And of course, the, 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 the follow-up by another scholar <laughs> titled Marco Polo Went to China. It seems pretty clear that there's, there's enough that he saw that is, that is not in doubt, that he probably did make some sort of fairly thorough voyage. You know, whether or not he spent that much time in the court of Kublai Khan, as he claims... Um, but he has pretty dis convincing descriptions of Kublai Khan's court. In particular, he also notes that spice gathering is fairly easy and that some of the legends about poisonous steaks or, or it being in, in ravines or hard to get places are just not true and that actually you grow spices the way you grow most other crops. And, and here's an image you can see. Uh, he also notes the burning of corpses in India. Of course, he, he thinks that this is somewhat terrible. Um, but describes reasonably convincingly um, Indian last rites, the burning of bodies. You can also see the the cow looking uh, looking somewhat sanctified in his little altar there. Um, so some experience with with real Hinduism. Now, part of the doubt about Marco Polo is actually that he still includes some of these legends. And even though he shows some skepticism, sometimes he also just says, well, you know, the, I, I heard about those and they're further out there, but I, I didn't get there. I didn't see them exactly. And so, so some of the book feels like hearsay. And so, as I said before, some people think that most of the book is hearsay, but, but really the evidence is pretty convincing that a lot of it is from his own description, even if not all of it. And here's one last image about one possible route of his journey. And of course, there's been a lot more scholarship wondering where exactly he went, if he did go to, if we know that he went to China, how, how far did he go? How much time did he spend in India? Did he actually go through Southeast Asia? And like other journeys, we won't know exactly where it is that he went because he describes some things better than others. But it's clear that he has seen a lot of Asia by the time he comes back couple of decades after he leaves. Now, one direct consequence of this is that the, uh, the, Fra the Fra Mauro map, you can see an image here from the 1450s, um, finished after the, the friar's death in 1459, is, is a map that he actually claims he got information direct from Marco Polo. He said he had seen a map that came from China that was brought back by the Polo brothers. Now, whether or not that's true is very hard to know, but one of the things that the map does is that you can see here that you can actually sail around the southern tip of Africa. There was some doubt as to whether that was possible. Some people thought that it would get too hot because they knew it got hotter and hotter. They thought that people just couldn't survive if you went far enough south. There was some doubt as to whether or not it would be navigable, whether or not there was even water. Now, this sound, might sound a little bit like idle speculation, but you can think of something like the Northwest Passage. People are fairly convinced that there's a water route over the top of Canada or through somewhere in the middle of the continent. And, you know, there's a lot of water and navigable waterways, but it turns out that there's not. So they weren't entirely sure that they could sail around the southern horn of Africa. Frau Maro draws this map that says, yes, you can. Um, and that inspires people like the Portuguese to actually go and try. And this guy's sort of standing in for the Portuguese. This is Prince Henry, the navigator. He's called Prince Henry. He was never actually king. Um, not necessarily a navigator himself, but very interested in navigation. He, he presumably did know a fair amount about it and gathered around him a fair amount of knowledge and, and people who had studied maps and knew about where they were going in the world and really encouraged Portuguese expansion by sea. And part of this, of course, is that they're backed up against Castile, Castile, 
Um, his father, Joao I, had only barely kept the throne against Spanish incursions, so there was some concern about Portuguese independence still. His father had a claim to the throne that the king of Castile also had a claim, and so they they fight this really fateful battle in which Joao just barely wins. But he then lives a really long time and has several really important sons, one of whom is Prince Henry. Uh, he has several important children. But his long reign really cements Portuguese independence. But it's still not clear to them that Portugal will remain independent. So he's sponsoring a lot of seagoing travel. I mentioned earlier with the, the beginning of the slave trade that they're traveling south through along the African coast. That's what leads them to discover things like the Madeira Islands. And, and what he's doing really is a mix of legendary history, uh, real politics, geopolitics, and a genuine search for wealth. William of Rubric, John Mandeville, Marco Polo, all of them describe wealth that is out there that is available. The legend of Prester John is still not gone, so they think that they might find both Christian assistance, uh, military assistance, wealth and trade, independence for Portugal by having roots that don't rely on being too close to Spain. And of course, in 1497, just a few years after Columbus, Vasco da Gama from Portugal makes his way all the way around the Horn of Africa and arrives in India and, and somewhat legendarily, one of the first things that he says is, I come in search of Christians and spices. So again, exactly the elision of the things of wealth that they both knew were in the East and, and needed new access to. And of course, part of going around Africa for Portugal is not just avoiding Spain, but also avoiding Muslim traders and not uh, enriching Islam. So the, the Christian half of that matters to the both to the political and economic sides as well. And Vasco da Gama is actually deeply frustrated by the fact that one of the first people he meets in India is a Tunisian who speaks Spanish. So they communicate in Spanish with a Muslim who he was hoping to avoid by going around Africa in the first place. And so he, he actually... Is, is rather annoyed that this is the person then who brings him around and says, oh, you can meet these people. This is who you trade with. Like his fixer is one of the very people that he was trying to avoid who he speaks to in Spanish. So it's a sort of deep irony of his voyage, even though his voyage is a real watershed in terms of European trade and expansion. On the flip side, this is one of the big differences between Walter de, uh, Vasco da Gama and Columbus is that Columbus has nobody to talk to. Columbus has a huge amount of difficulty communicating, figuring out who to work with. He doesn't know how to interact with local rulers. There isn't a big lavish court that he can go to. So on the flip side, when Vasco da Gama arrives in, in India, he has a pretty easy time of it because he's got a fixer. Even though the guy is Islamic and, and all of that, it makes it much easier for him to figure out, okay, this is where I go, this is how I trade, this is what I bring back. And in fact, he brings back quite quite a few things to trade with and becomes quite wealthy from it. It makes him a little jaded about the whole trip, and, and only Calcutta really impresses Vasco, Vasco da Gama, although he keeps thinking that he's seeing Christians, and, and you can sort of understand why from what I've said, but, but only Calcutta is really impressive for just how much stuff it has. And one last thing about Vasco da Gama, you really get a sense of how much he expected there to just be wealth in these places where he was going. When he meets an Indian king, one of the first things the king says is, but you don't have anything for us to trade with. And Vasco da Gama is thinking, well, don't you just have excess of it? Can I just sort of take it with me? And then the king says, well, no, this is a, you know, this is, this is a trade. Uh, you got to bring stuff. You buy stuff from us. You bring gold or whatever. We, you know, we've been doing it with the Muslims for, for years. Um, so on the one hand, it you know, makes his life is, is disappointing for Vasco da Gama that he hasn't escaped the sort of regular system of economy and dealing with the Muslims that he was trying to get away from. But on the other hand, he is actually able to engage in trade. And this does prove incredibly lucrative for the Portuguese. So that's Vasco da Gama. Now on to the very last one, um, Columbus himself, with which we will end the whole lecture and the whole course. Now, I already mentioned Columbus a little bit when we went over the politics of Ferdinand and Isabella of Castile and Aragon, in reverse order there. 
and I mentioned something about the political consolidation of Spain that is coming to a point right as Columbus is about to sail. Now, Columbus had actually asked several other people to finance his voyage. In some sense, it is the hubris and arbitrariness of the Spanish monarchs that actually gets him his money. Because he goes to the Portuguese first, because of course the Portuguese are some of the best navigators around. And, and he thinks that the Portuguese will be more likely to finance a voyage of this sort. They've are, they're already financing voyages down the African coast. He knows that they're interested in this sort of thing. But in some sense, the Portuguese are too smart. When he says that he's going to go east to get to China, the Portuguese actually have a pretty good sense of how big the world is. And I should note that the first globe is actually made in Europe before Columbus sails. So there's a, a globe available, and uh, here's a quick image of it, that doesn't have the new world on the globe. But they already knew roughly that the world was round, and the, the Portuguese, the best navigators at the time, even had a sense of how big it was. So when Columbus said, I'm going that way, the Portuguese said, uh, you want a ship that is how big? You are not going to make it that distance. And frankly, if he were crossing open water from Spain to China, he would not have made it that distance. They're absolutely right about that. But he goes to the Spanish, and they have this newly consolidated country. They have a sense of expansionist desires. As I've mentioned before, literally right as Columbus sails is when they are removing the last independent Muslim kingdom from within their territory. They have consolidated Catholic power in Spain. They are launching what will become the Spanish Inquisition. They're beginning to look beyond their borders for expansion of the Spanish power. And so it's right at that moment that Columbus says, I think I can get to China. I am looking for Prester John. I am looking for a Christian kingdom. I am looking for a way to make an end run around Muslim power. All of these things fit in well to the Spanish worldview. And so they finance his voyage. And he goes on his trip now, this image that you're looking at is a single page from Columbus's personal copy of Marco Polo in Latin. So not only is he aware of these previous stories, he has brought the book with him. It has all of his little annotations. If you look on the left margin of the left page, there's a little hand pointing at something saying, this is really important. And some of these annotations say, you know, I think I'm going to find this. This is what I'm looking for. He has it all planned out according to the narratives of these previous travelers. And there's a reason that when he gets to the island of, of what he calls Hispaniola in the Caribbean and to what will eventually become Cuba also, he says that these places um, abound in various kinds of spices, gold, and other metals. And he goes on to promise gold, spices, and mastic all things that Europe is currently importing from the East. So he really, at least initially, believes that he has gotten there and that some of these things are available. Now, obviously, they do eventually find gold, and rather a lot of it, and silver also from the Mexican silver mines. But initially, Columbus has very much the opposite problem of somebody like Vasco da Gama. He doesn't encounter an empire, right? And it's not until over 20 years later that Cortes will really have his run in with the Aztecs and eventually conquer the Aztecs, who represent a very large and powerful body that can command resources and set up trade networks. In the Caribbean, where Columbus lands, he doesn't really have that opportunity. So initially, he's incredibly frustrated, not only to have not found a kingdom, he hasn't found the exact spices that he's looking for, although initially he claims or believes that he has, it takes him much longer to figure out what it is that he's looking at because he has this huge set of expectations that have come from this previous set of narratives and, and travels. So this brings us then really to the end of this lecture, right? Globalization, as I mentioned at the beginning, is something that already starts well earlier than this, right? The Greeks and the Romans already had a sense of how large the world was. And in fact, one of the first estimates even remote accurate estimates of the circumference of the world comes from a Greek philosopher. They already have a sense of what is out there. And Columbus is part of this very long tradition where you have Silk Road trade in the early medieval period, an expansion of trade in the 11th and 12th century, as we talked about earlier, and an increasing interest on the part of Europeans to go out to distant places to see what there is. An interest in, to some extent, driven by 
Christian mythology, to some extent driven by interest in profit, and to some extent just driven by a sense of discovery. Portugal has begun doing this down the coast of Africa, eventually around the Horn of Africa and to India, and Spain finances what in some senses could have been just another experiment like the Vivaldi brothers to sail west and see what happens, but turns out to be the fateful voyage of linking the Americas and Europe and really launching a very different and new time of actual globalization. It is after this point when there are Christian missionaries really all over the world from Japan to Argentina to Africa It is at this point when European colonies begin to appear around the rest of the world, and this is not unique to Spain and their encounter with the Americas, but rather is is part and parcel of Portugal or the Netherlands or eventually England, going out and looking for new places to establish economic influence and control. So while globalization has been going on for a long time, in some sense it is Columbus, to go back to the beginning of the lecture, that is one of the watersheds in globalization, it is because after this, while there is still plenty of exploration, you have voyages like the voyage of of Captain Cook in the South Pacific, there are more things that the Europeans want to go out and chart and navigate and describe, and that will continue for centuries. But it is at this moment when the world suddenly expands and there is no going back from the amount of linkages that there are between places. The stage has been set for transatlantic trade, for the slave trade, for much more intensive exploitation of Africa by European powers, all of the things that will make the early modern period look like what it is rather than the medieval period. So with that, we end the lecture and we end the course. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Thank you.